renovation television shows are been a big hit for many years now. Uh, I remember the first one that Tammy got me to watch was called Trading Spaces. You might remember that. Uh, two couples would come together and uh, they would trade houses and, and renovate one room in the other's home with the help of a guest designer and a carpenter. And uh, I hear that that show's coming back with all the original cast. Um, but since that time, you've got a, a whole network, HGTV, it seems like that's all they have are renovation shows. And there's uh, different programs like Property Brothers and Love It or List It and Flip or Flop. Uh, our personal favorite is Fixer Upper. Uh, but, but they all have basically the same idea. People come in and they take a home that may be dated, uh, it may be old, even structurally weakened, and they fix it up, make it more presentable and, and hopefully more livable. And uh, you, you see um, a lot of these shows and, and even some spin-offs of these shows that are coming out. Now sometimes the fixes are, are pretty simple. Uh, you might even classify them as cosmetic, a little paint on the walls, maybe a different flooring, changing some windows. While other times, it's just a total gut job. <laughs> and, and they almost have to start over. And it's really hard to recognize that that's the same place they began with. I mention that because as we continue in our study of what it means to be human, we've spent a few weeks on the problem of sin. And I confess, I felt a little bit bad because it just seems over the last three weeks, it's always been such a downer, you know? It's been so negative, it's almost to the point of being depressing. When you see the effects of sin and how it has infected every part of our lives, it has introduced corruption into our bodies, and now we are susceptible to illness, to injury, to aging, ultimately to death. It, it has uh, affected us in our, our soul, our mind, our, our heart. You know, the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, more than we can ever realize ourselves. Our will has been affected. Now we we tend to choose wrong rather than right. We have a bent in our will. We kind of illustrated how this works uh, with a, the idea of a three-story building. If you can imagine yourself as a, a three-story building, the body is the first floor, the soul is the second floor, and the spirit is the third floor. Imagine sin like being a bomb dropped on the top of that building, and it explodes on impact. That third floor, the spirit, is just pretty much obliterated. The second and first floors are still there and they're still standing, but, but the walls are kind of bowed out. There's some cracks. Uh, they definitely have been weakened and compromised. We said that's kind of how sin has affected us. Remember in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, we know that they ate of that fruit. We also know they didn't drop over dead. Physically, they continued to live on. Psychologically, they continued to function. So what died? The spirit. The spirit of mankind died. Now, does that mean it ceased to exist? No. It means it was separated. It was cut off from God. And that is the condition every human being, with the exception of Jesus, has been born into the world. We are dead in our transgressions and sins, Paul writes. Spiritually, we are dead. Psychologically and physically, we have been corrupted. We've been affected adversely by sin. But the good news is that God is in the renovation business. And I don't mean by fixing up old homes. He goes to work in our lives. The promise of salvation 
is not cosmetic. It is a complete overhaul of who we are in every aspect of our being. As we're going to see this morning, God first goes to work reviving the spirit. He begins at the top and works down. And then he restores the soul. And finally, he will resurrect the body, ultimately bringing us back to what he originally designed humans to be. HGTV had one of those shows called Divine Design. This is really the divine design. God's design for us. And he wants to make that a reality in our lives once again. Now the first step in this process is reviving the spirit. There's a a hymn in the hymn to revive us again. What do we mean by revive? Revive means to bring life into something that once had it. (laughs) It is revitalizing the spirit of man. And this happens at the moment of salvation. When a person first puts their trust in Jesus Christ, God revives their spirit. Jesus talks about this in the passage read earlier from John 3. In talking to Nicodemus, Jesus says, You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And he scratches his head and says, Born again? Are you kidding? I'm old. How am I going to get in my mother's womb to be born a second time? Jesus says, Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, I know that a lot of uh, scholars have kind of debated about this passage. The word that Jesus uses for born again can also be translated born from above. And they argue, which one did Jesus mean? I don't think there's an argument. I think he meant both. John loves to use words with double meanings. And both of them fit. Both of them apply. We are born again and we're born from above. It's something God does in our lives. But it truly is a new birth because our spirit is being made alive. Psychologically and physically, we've been functioning since our natural birth. We need a spiritual birth. And Jesus explains this in verse 5. He says, unless you are born of water and the Spirit. Now, I've heard a lot of preachers say, I've read a lot of commentators, they say this is talking about baptism, water baptism, spirit baptism. I don't believe that's the case. Because notice the very next thing he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. When he says you must be born of water, And of the Spirit, that water in this context means physical birth. And I won't get into all the details, but it has to do with how the ancient Greeks thought of the birthing process. They, they, They saw the whole thing as the water of the male and the water of the female come together and produce the seed and the child and all of that. Uh, Water in the Greek here is actually plural. You could say of waters and the Spirit. So this is speaking of physical birth. Now, if you are alive, you've been born, right? I know we used to joke about some people being hatched, but no. You've been born physically. Everybody's been born of the flesh. But what we need is to be born again of the Spirit. This is why born again and born from above, either one work. Because this is something that the Spirit of God does. Now, in theological circles, this is known as regeneration. Again, giving life. The Greek word that is translated regeneration twice in the New Testament literally means born again. (laughs) It's to be given life anew. We see it in uh, Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. Paul writes, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Notice, we're talking here of our initial salvation. 
not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, there's born again, and renewal. There's that word for regenerate. How? By the Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God literally gives birth to our spirit. He comes in and he takes up residence. And so we are born again in the spiritual sense. Romans 8, 9 through 11 tells us how this happens. Paul says, you, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. Now you might say, well, I'm not sure. Does the Spirit of God live in me? Maybe that's something that only certain Christians get. And some even teach that. You can be saved, but you don't have the Spirit until later on. Read on. Paul says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. Very simply put, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. It's not a, a, a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of feeling. If you are saved, you, this Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And that's a truth for every believer, not just certain ones, not just ones who have had a certain experience. If you have been saved, the Spirit of God comes and takes up residence in your spirit. That's how it's made alive. And Paul goes on, if Christ is in you, your body, meaning the, the old flesh, the old nature, is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you. See, this is one of the great things about the new covenant. Before, the spirit would come upon a person and give them power to do a certain task. But the spirit of God never lived within. Jesus told his disciples, it is better for you that I go away. Because right now I am with you, but I'm going to send the Spirit and He's going to be in you, living inside of us. And that's what happens from the moment we place our trust in Jesus. His Spirit comes in and takes up residence in us. Twice in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's Spirit lives in you? And, and these were not the most spiritual believers ever. <laughs> the, the Christians there in Corinth had a lot of problems that Paul was trying to correct. But even to them, he said, the Spirit of God lives in you. And he says it in such a way as, don't you know this? <laughs> you should know this. This is something that's basic for every believer. So the Holy Spirit revives our dead spirit by moving in taking up residence, and reestablishing our connection with God. Remember, spiritual death is separation from God. Spiritual life is being connected with God, and that's how this takes place. And it's known as justification. We are justified by faith, and the Spirit of God comes and lives in us. Now, this is important. This must happen first because everything else I'm going to share with you this morning doesn't apply if this hasn't taken place. Every part of God's renovating process is a work of the Holy Spirit. And unless He is living inside us, it's not going to happen. But the point I really want to make for us as Christians is that we shouldn't think of the Christian life as God forgiving our sins and giving us a second chance so we can try harder the next time. I hear a lot of Christians that, that feel that way. Well, God cleans my slate and now I can go at it again and I can try harder the next time. It's not about trying harder. It's about trusting God and allowing God's Spirit to work in us. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, 
His divine power. How do we get his power? Through the spirit lives in us. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Did you hear that? His divine power has given us everything we need. You know what that means for the Christian? We have no excuse. We have no excuse for not living for God. We have no excuse when we sin. We can't say, I couldn't help it. Oh, yes, we can. <laughs> because his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's not just eternal life when our life is over. We're talking right now. Everything we need to live the Christian life, we already have. Not something we have to gain, we have it. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Now, I don't want you to give the impression the Christian life is just, ah, I kick back in an easy chair and let God do everything. Because the very next paragraph in Peter says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and he goes on. There is still a responsibility we have. We are still called to, in the words of that great hymn, trust and obey. We still have to do that. Just understand, we don't have to do it in our own strength. We have been given everything we need. We're not passive in the process. But we do rely on the wisdom and the power of God. There's a cooperation there. And I'm not trying to say it's 50-50. It's more like 99.99 to 0.01. But there is that portion where we have to allow the Spirit to work and we have to obey what God leads us to do. Now this takes us to the second step of the renovation process. God begins restoring the soul. That phrase might sound a little familiar from the 23rd Psalm, right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Now, how do we understand soul? The soul is our personality. It's our mind, what we know. It's our heart, what we feel. It's our will, that power to choose, that gives direction to the body, which then does. This is what God restores. How? By his Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice there's a difference. The first part, reviving the Spirit, is done instantaneously and fully. You cannot get any more of the Holy Spirit than you have now. You do not get any more saved than you are at the moment of conversion. But this restoring of the soul is a process. It's gradual. It's going to take the rest of your life here on earth. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to be immediate, and it's not automatic. So everything we're going to talk about here, again, remember, it is a process. The Spirit goes to work reprogramming the mind. I think the best verse for this is Romans 12.2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. The Spirit begins with what we know. Why is that important? Because truth doesn't change. Truth is not a matter of opinion. Truth is truth. And we need to base our knowledge, and ultimately our choices on what we know, not necessarily what we feel. So God goes to work changing, reprogramming our minds. How does he do that? Through his word. This is where the word of God is so important. This is how God changes our minds, changes our thinking through the information that we get in his word, 
our minds are reprogrammed. It's like a computer that has a virus. It has, the virus has to be taken out. You can think of the virus as sin. And now it has to be reprogrammed to function correctly. The Spirit of God does this, and He does it through the Word. Paul writes in Romans 8, 6, The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. When we allow Him to come in and take control of our minds, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul talks about bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Why? Because our thinking guides our decisions, and our decisions guide our actions. It all begins in the mind. 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. So the Spirit first goes to work on what we know. Our minds are reprogrammed. Then he turns his attention to rejuvenating the will. This is our ability to choose. We read in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always what? Obeyed. Obedience is an act of the will. It's a choice we make. Not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation. Notice, he doesn't say work for your salvation. We can't do that. He's saying you work out your salvation. The obedience comes after you're saved, not in order to be saved. For it is God who works in you, here's the Spirit of God at work, to will and to act according to His good pleasure. There's the will. In fact, you could substitute the word choose there and it doesn't change the meaning. To choose and to act. The choice is made, and that leads to the behavior. The will, again, is very important because what we choose is what we do. And the Spirit of God rejuvenates the will to choose and to act according to His good purpose. Now, instead of just making choices based on what I want and what feels good to me, I'm concerned with what God wants and, and what He thinks is best. And then God focuses on repairing the heart. This is our emotions, what we feel. You know, three times in the Old Testament, God promises to give a holy heart transplant. In Jeremiah 24, He says, I will give them a heart to know Me. Now, this is the same prophet that earlier said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Our heart is diseased by sin. And I really firmly believe, and this is opinion, so I'm going to state it as such. I really believe that sin has corrupted the heart more than anything else. I think sin resides in our feelings more so than in any aspect of our being. Because our feelings tend to be very, very self-oriented. Why do we get angry? Because somebody did something to me. Why, do we, why are we happy? Because something good happened to me. Why are we sad? Because something was taken away from me. We tend to be very self-oriented. Now, I'm not saying all emotions are bad. I'm just saying they've been tainted. They've been corrupted. They become very self-oriented. God wants to repair that. He wants to repair our broken hearts. That we might feel the way He feels. This is also seen in Ezekiel 11. I will give them an undivided heart. That divided heart is really tough. You hear people talk about having mixed feelings about something. Well, I kind of feel this way and I feel this way and I'm kind of torn between the two. God says, I'm going to give you an undivided heart so that what you want and what I want are going to be the same. Later on in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove that heart of stone, that hardened heart, because of sin, and I will put a heart of flesh within you, sensitive. And then he says, I will put my spirit in you. The promise that was fulfilled at Pentecost was made all the way back in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God would live within us. Now again, these are gradual changes. As you look at these and you say, well, I'm not there yet, that's okay. It's not the perfection God looks for here in this life. It is the direction of our lives. Are we moving toward Him? Are we growing in our knowledge of the Word? Do we know more now than we did a year ago about God and His Word? Do we know more now than we did five years ago or ten years ago? How about our actions? I'm not saying we're perfect. We still stumble and fall. But are we doing better making good choices now than we did a year ago or five years ago? See, we ought to be moving. And don't worry about the pace of somebody else. Oh, someone's going faster than me. So what? Don't worry about that. You just make sure you're headed in the right direction and that you're making some progress in your Christian life. That's the Spirit of God at work within you. I mentioned Romans 12, 2 earlier, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transformed in the Greek is the word from which we get metamorphosis. Remember that from grade school biology? <laughs> That's how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Transformed from the inside out. It's a process. In fact, you'll know that a, a caterpillar will, will spin a cocoon and only when everything is right, they'll come out of the cocoon as a beautiful butterfly. I heard of a, a child once who saw the cocoon and, and saw something inside like it was struggling to get out and thought, well, I want to help it. And so he took a little knife and slit the side of the cocoon and it killed the insect. Why? Tried to rush the process and you can't rush that process. Don't rush the process of sanctification, which is what this is all about. It's the Spirit of God at work in you, bringing the image of Christ into our lives, making us more like Him. Then finally is the resurrecting the body. This is the ultimate makeover. This is where we see it the most. Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, a time is coming. When all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. I want you to notice this is a truth for everybody, not just Christians. You know, we talk about eternal life like it's only the believers that will live on forever. Everybody is going to live on forever. The question is where? Are we going to be with God in heaven? Or are we going to be separated from God in hell? But even those who are in hell are going to be there forever. And they're going to be alive. They're going to be in a, a glorified body that feels pain. So this is a, a truth for all humans. But Paul writes of the resurrection of the righteous in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17. Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. That's a euphemism for have died physically. Or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have died in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Again, those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Jesus is coming, and when he comes, all believers will rise to meet him. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we will all be changed in the flash and the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Notice again, the dead rise first, then those who are alive will be changed. They'll be given new bodies. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, mortal with immortality. We must have new glorified bodies in order to live forever. And they're not just going to be like our bodies now. These are bodies without the curse of sin, without the corruption, without the disease, without the injuries, without aging, deterioration, and ultimately death. None of that will apply to this new body. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will be true. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Death will be no more. That's what we have to look forward to. Now, I believe when you put these texts alongside Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24, you see several similarities. Jesus comes in the clouds. There's the voice of the archangel. There's a trumpet. Notice Paul calls it the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15. And all who have trusted in Christ will be raised. Now, certainly no one knows when this will happen. Jesus taught that himself. No one, not even the Son of Man knows. Only the Father in heaven. But I do believe that we see all of these elements come together in Revelation 14, 14 through 16, in conjunction with the seventh the last trumpet. We read, just before the bowls of God's wrath are poured out on the unbelievers, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. That was Jesus' favorite designation for himself. With a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then an angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him seated on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap. Because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Earlier, Jesus taught a parable about the end of time, and he likened it to the harvest. Where first, the wheat is harvested and gathered into the barn. Then the weeds are harvested and burned. Here he speaks of the harvest, and right after this in Revelation 14, there's another harvest of grapes thrown into the winepress of God's wrath. Fits perfectly with Jesus' earlier teaching. This is going to happen, folks. Christ is going to come. Not, Not everybody's going to agree with that interpretation. That's all right. But the truth is, we have that hope. Whether it's in our lifetime or it could be many years after we've passed from the scene, God is going to come back. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, if we are still here at the time, will be changed. and We will be given eternal bodies. Talk about the ultimate makeover. <laughs> New bodies that will live forever. And this is called glorification. I want you to notice, justification, first, the reviving of the Spirit, that's something that's already happened. If you've trusted in Christ, that's a past event. Glorification, the resurrecting of the body, is something future. That's something we're looking forward to. But it's that one in the middle, restoring the soul. That's right now. That's a process that starts at salvation And doesn't end until we go to be with the Lord. We're going to take the next several weeks and look at how our souls are restored. Mind, heart, will. We'll even take one week on the idea of conscience, which we really haven't talked about yet. But we're going to spend some time on that as well because God works that as as well. This is what's going on in our lives today. So... I ask you this morning, have you begun that journey? Have you initially put your trust in Jesus Christ and invited him to come in?
If you have, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you, and you are alive spiritually, and you have everything you need for life and godliness because the Spirit of God lives in you. Christian, are you seeing the Holy Spirit at work, doing His renovation work, restoring your soul? Not asking if you're perfect, but is He producing His fruit? The love, the joy, the peace, patience, self-control. Is he developing your gifts to be used within the church family? Can you see a difference in your life from now since you've come to Christ? We're going to look at how the Spirit of God does that very specifically. The most important step we must take is to allow him in and permit him to work. And I guarantee you, you're going to like the results of his renovation.